The long, hot summer of 1940 was a scorcher, with temperatures in the 90s. Who would have dreamed that this was wartime? Certainly not Londoners, many of whom continued to visit seaside resorts such as Brighton, Margate and Southend for the day, just across the channel from occupied France. Little wonder they called it the phony war, until the government said otherwise. It's important that we should be prepared against death. Put it on for 10 to 15 minutes, one day a week. It may be a little irksome at first, but you'll soon get used to it. Here in London, unbeknown to most, the Port Authority was already preparing for war and the possibility of invasion. To the casual observer, it looked like business as usual in London's docks. Amid the teeming quaysides and busy warehouses, an atmosphere of optimism prevailed. In the period leading up to the war, the PLA commissioned a scale model of the port, together with a documentary film celebrating the wealth of its achievements. Perhaps the best barometer of the times is to listen to the pride and confidence which brims from this film. Not only is London the greatest metropolis of the world, but also, and above all, it is a great seaport, a marine city whose main channels, tributaries and backwaters are crammed with traffic. Traffic that passes to and from the open sea and through one of the most up-to-date dock systems in the world. London's port lay at the heart of a vast empire, a veritable warehouse of the world, which handled over a quarter of the entire nation's imports. Factories, engineering workshops, processing plants and shipyards lined the riverfront and nearby districts. A fact not lost on the German high command. Cripple the port and you paralyze London. Paralyze London and you kill resistance to invasion. The port of London became target area A, an area which included the Ford plant at Dagenham, huge gas works at Beckton, and the munitions factories of the Woolwich Arsenal, all en route up the Thames. Along with aerial photography, the Luftwaffe used their own model of London's port to train pilots in preparation for attacks. Saturday the 7th of September was another hot summer's day. Against the late afternoon sky, it was easy to mistake the silver glint of approaching planes for RAF maneuvers until the firestorm began. At about 5 p.m., the first of 400 Heinkel and Dornier bombers began their descent over London. Another 400 arrived around 8 p.m. to continue the attacks. Damage to the docks was devastating, and many lives were lost north and south of the river on what quickly became known as Black Saturday. Incendiary attacks began fires which burned for five days. Not since the Tooley Street Fire of 1861 had South London endured such widespread destruction. On the north bank, cargoes of flour, paint, rubber and sugar sent an inferno of flames into the night sky which was visible for miles around. This little scene footage filmed by the London Fire Brigade is from September the 25th, 1940 after 18 days of successive bombardment. Prime Minister Winston Churchill toured the stricken areas. Traveling on the PLA launch, Noor, he took to the Thames to review the damage inflicted by enemy action. Here, Churchill is seen examining damage to flour mills at the Royal Victoria docks, 
and the devastation inflicted on the nearby community of Silvertown. London and its port remained a prime target for the next four years. Despite ferocious air raids, as well as V-1 and V-2 rocket attacks, the docks continued to operate. Indeed, the port played a vital role in supporting Britain's war effort, and port workers were responsible for the development of many secret wartime projects. <laughs> 